Good morning, folks. Everybody could uh, grab their seat. I know it was a late night for some folks uh, going through the budget kicking up budget season, so we're all going to be pretty busy. So I appreciate everybody coming out tonight, uh, this morning. So uh, for folks who don't know me, I'm Eric Lenzer. I'm the president and CEO of the New York Health Plan Association. And on behalf of HPA and our member plans, welcome to today's policy forum, Access to Innovation, How Our State's Addressing Prescription Drug Costs. Uh, HPA hosts a number of policy forums each year in an effort to bring together stakeholders and others in the healthcare community to discuss ways to promote high quality, affordable, safe health care that's really grounded in best practices. So we appreciate you taking the time to be at today's forum. Um, now while breakthrough medications offer tremendous clinical benefits to, for patients, uh, prescription drug spending has been uh, you know, a constant and ongoing pressure for folks in the healthcare space, whether it's providers, health plans, consumers, and even the state. Today's forum will examine current spending trends associated with prescription drug costs, the impact on healthcare costs, and then policy approaches that folks ought to be considering as a way to still maintain access to important clinical advances, but how do we get at underlying costs? Uh, we're excited today to have Sarah Emond here, who's the um, uh, Executive VP and Chief Operating Officer of ICER. Uh, for folks who aren't familiar with ICER, it's a non a uh, nonprofit, a uh, nonpartisan research organization that objectively looks at uh, issues related to clinical advances, whether it's in the prescription drug space, med you know, new medical technologies. And really, you know, I think you know, for folks who haven't seen the work that they've done, the short answer is it's excellent. They provide really a meaningful uh, way to look at the, the question of how do we get at maintaining access to innovation while at the same time looking at the issue of affordability. So we're excited to have Sarah here uh, kick off the forum in just a couple of moments. A more complete bio on Sarah as well as the rest of the panelists are in uh, your flyer, but we um, have a, an exceptional reactor panel uh, that's, that will come on uh, after Sarah's presentation. We're excited to have Assemblyman Dan, Daniel Rosenthal here, who's the chair of the subcommittee on intergenerational care. Uh, Helen Shaw, who is the Vice President of uh, New York State Policy and Legislative Director for 1199 SEIU. Uh, Chuck Bell, uh, who is the Programs Director for Consumer Reports. And then Eileen Wood, who is the Senior Vice President of Clinical Inter Integration and the Chief Pharmacy Officer for CDPHP. Uh, before we get, uh, get started, I would like to thank the HPA staff for their hard work in putting together today's forum. Uh, without them, you know, forums like this and our annual conference, which takes place later this year in November, really couldn't happen. So we really appreciate the hard work that, that they put into uh, making these types of programs go on, as well as their ongoing work on behalf of the industry each and every day. Uh, before I ask Sarah to come up here, I did want to acknowledge a couple of legislative staff in, in, in the room. Uh, Amber Schneider from Senator Breslin's office uh, and Morgan Hollering from uh, the Senate Republicans are both here. So thank you for taking the time, and I know there'll be some other folks who come in uh, during the course of today's session. So with that, uh, I'd like to ask Sarah to come on up and begin today's discussion. So please uh, join me in welcoming Sarah Dima. able to address uh, a group from the Health Plan Association. Um, so I, I think that means I did okay last time. You guys have me back from Boston, so thank you so much for that. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that conversation. And so my remarks will be on the brief side. I want to give you guys a bit of a grounding in what is value assessment. Um, and I'll do so by introducing who ICER is and how we do our work, a little snapshot of some of our results, and then sort of segue into what are states doing? about uh, this issue of uh, prescription drug pricing. Um, how are some using our work? What are the other things outside of comparative effectiveness research that people are doing to try to figure out how to address this problem? And then I want to tee up a few of the opportunities and challenges I see, um, hopefully to spur the conversation. 
I, you know, I already had a, a quick conversation about how sometimes we feel like this is job security, the work we do. This is really hard. Um, and so we're going to be working with this for a long time. But that doesn't mean we can't pause and, and, and think about the ways we've had some victories. And New York has been um, one of those that um, we'll get into a little bit. Um, and then just the opportunities we all have to really stay focused on what matters at the end of the day, which is making sure patients get access to the care they need at a price that does not bankrupt families and the health system. And I do believe that is possible. People think I'm very Pollyanna for continuing to believe that that is true, but I do think that is possible. So, oh. Healthcare system like the UK or Canada, you have a reason to do this because you are tasked with using a limited budget to provide the most health for your residents. So you usually have a central agency, it's usually a government agency, that asks the same questions that ICER does. We sort of, um, we, we exist because we have our uniquely American healthcare system uh, with 800 different payers, uh, private and then all the Medicaid and then what Medicare can do. Um, and so we have no regulatory authority. No one has to listen to what we do, but we try to advance this conversation of what do we know about evidence as a way to make policy. One thing that's really distinctive about our process is that it's out in the open and it's public. Um, I don't have to tell people in the room who come from the health plan side that health plans have been doing health technology assessment for a really long time. This is what they do in their p and committees. This is how they evaluate where things are on different tiers, whether we're talking about drugs um, uh, or provider pricing. This, is, this, is, this gets done. Um, one of the reasons that um, we started over 12 years ago was because we wanted to facilitate a public conversation about this, where we had all of the stakeholders at the table. The thing that we do not shy away from that gets us a lot of attention is we talk about cost. Um, comparative effectiveness research, which is an, another umbrella term, uh, a lot of times uh, people think about just the comparative clinical effectiveness. How is this new drug better than what we already um, use from a clinical perspective? Um, that's slightly less controversial. Um, it is sometimes still controversial, but lots of wonderful researchers do uh, interesting research in this area. What makes our work distinctive is we take it one step further and we do an analysis to say, how much more are we paying for that added clinical benefit? Um, and this facilitates a conversation about, well, what does that mean we can't pay for because we're overpaying for this? Or we might be underpaying for this high value service, and what does that mean in terms of health loss? These are the conversations that get facilitated by our work. The other distinctive part of this, not only the eight-month process where our drafts are public and we have stakeholder interaction throughout the entire time, including with patients, clinical experts, and the manufacturers, is that we bring our work to an independent council of experts in evidence-based medicine so that they can <coughs> debate what we've concluded, what we've said, and sometimes they say we disagree, sometimes they say we agree, and they make judgments on what is the comparative clinical value of something new and what is its value from long-term uh, value for money perspective. Um, and those votes are done out in the open and available for any decision maker to use in their own decision making. So at the end of the day, we do believe that we can come up with a fair price, and then that would demand fair access from the payer community, and then we have plenty of money for future innovation. We consider this the grand bargain, we consider this achievable, and I'll talk about a few examples when we go through. So, the goal is fair price, fair access, and future innovation. We think there's two components that we have to think about, the long-term value for money and the short-term affordability. There's four buckets here for what we think about long-term value for money. And you'll see the comparative clinical effectiveness is anchored there. Um, a lot of people think that we just do some math and we come up with some arbitrary like, line. But this is all driven by what did the data tell us about how much better a new drug is than what we're already doing. 
And most of the time, because we're looking at reports at or near the time of FDA approval, that means that we're looking at clinical trial data. Um, and that clinical trial data, those decisions about what outcomes to make are chosen by the manufacturer. And so that anchors the entire comparative, uh, the, the entire long-term value to our money calculation. Um, and then the cost-effectiveness piece I've already mentioned. This is um, a technique that was developed by American doctors and health economists over 30 years ago. And they were working in um, systems that had a, a capped budget. And they were being asked, make wise choices to improve the health of your patients, and oh, by the way, uh, you can't spend more than X. And they were struck by how little information they had to make those decisions for their patients. There was no data on how much more cost-effective one surgery was than another, or one intervention for low back pain. And so that was the impetus. This came from the medical community. They said, wait, we have a way that we can judge so that we can maximize the most health for the most people. I'll just briefly mention the short-term affordability. We do a potential budget impact. This, this alarm bell that we raise when there's a potential affordability issue only happens occasionally, and this is more for something that might have a high cost, um, the, price, the fair price might be high, and there's a lot of eligible people. The classic example that everyone in this room probably still has um, some feelings about is hepatitis C. So the hepatitis C drugs, when they got approved, even at $84,000 a year, which was sticker shock and lots of stories about, was actually cost effective using traditional methods. <coughs> Um, but our report signaled that if three to five million people are eligible, like just do that math and realize that that's creating an affordability challenge. So we do this analysis just to give people, policymakers, a chance to facilitate a grown-up conversation about what what might we have to do, either with price or tiering access, something along those lines, so that we're not bankrupting health systems. Next, please. You're going to get a quick lesson in cost effectiveness. Bear with me. It's very, very quick. <laughs> this is called the cost effectiveness plane. I just want to demystify this a little bit. The blue dot that you see in the middle is what we do now. Say so that's the comparator for a new drug that's coming on the market. So what if we get this new drug approved and it's more effective? You can see it's moved over on that axis. And it's a little bit more expensive. Well, we might be willing to pay for that. Right? OK. Well, click again. What if we have one that's even more effective, you know, just a little, but it's way more expensive? How do we know which one we should choose? Cost effectiveness helps us draw the line. The line is the cost effectiveness plane. This is the threshold that maximizes health. There is research that shows us what we spend over this threshold, and for the United States in terms of our GDP and a whole bunch of other um, uh, Statistics that help us know what this line is, it's about $100,000 per quality adjusted life year, which is the measure of added health. And we know that when we spend over that, there's real net harm to patients because premiums go up, cost sharing goes up, and they, they, they access less care and they have more harm. So this is the health maximization threshold. This could be a bit, this is a bit controversial. Drawing this line um, causes people to be uncomfortable because now you're saying, I can't get access to that yellow dot above the line. But in fact, that's not what we're saying. If you click one more time, and one more time, we're saying there's a price at which you can bring that yellow dot under the threshold and everybody gets access. That's cost effectiveness in 30 seconds. <laughs> just last thing on ICER, just to give you a snapshot of what we've found. So these are some results from our 2018 and 2019 reports. If you see a number in red, that's our recommendation of uh, the price discount you would need to bring that yellow dot below the health maximization threshold. But you'll also see some green, which are prices that were already under that line. Like just twice from here. Thank you. Some of the more expensive drugs that have been approved, um, we could add Zolgensma to this list as well, um, didn't need a discount at all. Um, some, including Lipa for hemophilia A with inhibitors, was cost savings. We can get in, there's probably people in the room who go, well, that's because the comparator was really expensive. I am happy to nerd out about the nuances of some of these, but at the, at the end of the day, what we're, what we're signaling here is sometimes there is a, a price chosen by the manufacturer that aligns very well with the clinical benefit that patients receive, and that's exactly the type of innovation that we want to incentivize. 
And when we have innovation where we're looking at things like 70, 80, 90% discounts off of the, the, most of the time we're using average net price to, to align with the clinical benefit that patients are receiving, that's opportunity cost. That's money that we're not able to spend to maximize health in other areas. And there is a price for every drug that we have looked at, save two, there is a price that aligns with the clinical benefit. So let's shift a little bit about what's happening broadly. There are probably people in this room, that I know, there are people in this room who know way more about what's happened with New York Medicaid than I am. So forgive me, but I'm gonna give you our perspective on uh, what we've known uh, from working with the team and, and participating in some of the meetings. But New York really um, was one of the first to draw the line in the sand and say, there is a, a cap on how much we should spend on prescription drugs. There needs to be some reining in of spending more and more every year. And so when they passed the legislation for the first time back in 2017, if I'm recalling correctly, what they basically did was say, we have the ability to ask for a supplemental rebate for drugs that we think are piercing our affordability cap. They're causing us to overspend on the target we want to spend for prescription drugs for Medicaid. And we have a whole series of things we can do if the manufacturer refuses to give us that rebate. What was really interesting about the first year that it was applied was I believe they identified close to 30 drugs from 12 different manufacturers and only one drug from one manufacturer got referred to the public process that is in the legislation that says that they can go there if the manufacturer refuses to give a discount to Medicaid to make the drug more affordable. And in that case, it was the drug or can be from Vertex for cystic fibrosis. And so the, the legislation in New York says, we can do a lot of things if you refuse to give us the supplemental rebate that we've asked for. We can do an analysis of how much the state is spending. We can look at other rebates that you're giving us on other drugs. We can look at existing cost effectiveness information. And we can look at other measures of comparative value and independent value assessment. And we can refer you to a public drug utilization review board process, which is exactly what they did in April of 2018. And if I recall, I think it was down the hall. It looked an awful lot like the hallway I was just in walking in today. And we had done a report on CF. So all of our information was already publicly available. It was out there for um, uh, uh, people to react to. We were just finalizing the report, but the draft was out when they invited us to present our information about what a fair price for a candy would be based on the clinical benefit that patients receive. What we see here, and you can click through one more if you want. Thank you. We do our analysis at different willingness to pay thresholds. I hinted earlier that about 100,000 per quality adjusted life year is the is the uh, the one that most health economists and other researchers have identified as the point at which spending above um, has some net harm to, to patients. But we recognize that there are different budgets, different willingness to pay thresholds that individual policymakers may have for their own plans their own populations. So we produce information in a series of thresholds. And we did this and we explained this to the Drug Utilization Review Board and they themselves pitched the 150,000 per quality threshold as the fair price threshold. And that was the price, the delta between that and WAC was the supplemental rebate that they then um, directed Vertex to give on board camping. This got a lot of attention. It still gets a lot of attention. It's interesting how what actually happened gets twisted to um, fit certain narratives. But at the end of the day, what the Drug Utilization Review Board was saying was, there is a price. And like, by the way, there's a lot of us in this room. Because I was in industry for 10 years. I've been doing this since the late 90s, when $83,000 a year was a lot of money to pay for a drug. Um, and so it's not like we were saying that we should only be paying $5,000 a year for this drug. We actually think the fair price is in the seventy dollars to $80,000 a year range, but that's quite different um, than the price chosen by Vertex. And so this continues to get a lot of attention, and I, I wanted to dive into this because I want to talk a little bit about how other states are trying to model this. So the next slide. Massachusetts is taking a similar path. Please don't pretend that, I, I know you're not gonna read this, but if Eric sends these around later, you can never really look into some of the, the detail here. But what was interesting was how much this mirrors the New York process. So one quirky part of the legislation that was passed last July for Massachusetts was it gave MassHealth, our Medicaid department, the authority to directly negotiate with the manufacturer for a supplemental rebate. And people in this room may be like, 
why did you need special legislation for that? Because we had the most archaic procurement laws on the planet, and they had to do something insane, like they had to put it out for bid, even if there was only one manufacturer making the drug, it became very onerous, and so that's got streamlined in the legislation, so that was a win. So now Mass Health can directly negotiate supplemental rebates for drugs that it identifies, similarly to um, uh, New York, but not as prescriptive as North Health, as, as, as New York's law in terms of setting the, um, the spending cap, to drugs that are out of affordable for Mass Health. And then, if there is um, no agreement from the manufacturer, it has a series of steps that are very similar to New York in terms of what it can do. Um, it can have a public meeting on the proposed value if they can't reach a deal. If um, negotiations continue to fail, it can refer it to an external review board. It's not the Drug Utilization Review Board in this case, it's the Health Policy Commission, which is an existing quasi-governmental agency in New York that looks at affordability and costs. They are most known for looking at um, the uh, provider variation, high costs by um, hospitals that have a lot of market power. And the referral to the, excuse me, HPC, the Health Policy Commission, can also lead to additional information um, required from the manufacturer to disclose how much they charge in other countries, how much their research and development costs, and the Health Policy Commission ultimately has the ability to determine whether or not the price the manufacturer is putting out is unreasonable. We fully expect um, that the publicly available information that ICER produces will also be part of this conversation. So if you are the Health Policy Commission and you are trying to figure out whether or not a price is reasonable, if you have an independent analysis showing that a 90% discount would be needed in order for it to align with the clinical benefit for patients, we expect that this will be part of the conversation and we're watching this very closely. So what else is happening out there? The other state effort that I think um, warrants a little bit of time, and I encourage those with interest in this to visit um, NASHPE, the National Academy for State Health Policy. The link at the bottom of the slide is their legislation tracker. It's very comprehensive and it's excellent. It tells you what's been proposed, what's failed, what's passed. But what I'm watching closely is this idea of an affordability board. And what they're um, pushing here, so Maryland and Maine have both uh, passed legislation, it's uh, been signed into law, and they're taking um, their time sort of implementing, which is very wise. The idea here is that there will be an, a board made up of consumer representatives, uh, experts, et cetera, that might set an upper payment limit for a drug. Um, this is similar to basically the rate setting approach that was taken. Maryland's very famous for that in the hospital setting, and that's the uh, analogy that most of the policymakers who are interested in this approach use. Um, I'm watching this very closely because I'm very interested to know how they're going to set that upper payment limit. And I think that's the big question on everyone's mind. One of the things in our work that has been the most striking is that there are times when your gut reaction says that drug costs too much. $2.1 million for a gene therapy for a spinal muscular atrophy, that just costs too much. Because $2.1 million is a very big number. Our math and our approach actually says, well, wait a minute, what's the clinical benefit? And does it align with the price chosen? And in that one case, it did. So then there are times when we say, we looked at the CF example, that the price chosen by the manufacturer is well above the clinical benefit that you've been able to demonstrate that patients are receiving. And so then we've got a place where there could be some cost savings. And I mention this because if you're using an upper payment limit to say what the high, highest price you should be able to charge for a particular drug in a state is, um, you, you could get into the um, situation where you're like, well, my gut tells me that costs too much. And so I mention this because I think there's a role for preparative effectiveness research to play in helping us understand whether or not that upper payment limit aligns with anything based in the clinical data. So um, we're watching this very closely. It's still very early days. There's lots of cost. There's a strong possibility that these will get challenged um, by the pharmaceutical industry, so we'll see what ends up happening. But I think this is a really fascinating state experiment um, and one to watch closely to see if they're able to come up with a sort of bulletproof way to set that upper payment limit in a way that would bring greater affordability to states and better access for patients. <laughs> and I also just threw up there the other things that a lot of you probably are very familiar with. There was a, I call this low hanging fruit. There was a lot of um, action on PBMs and on transparency. Um, I say these were low hanging fruit because they're a little bit easy. If you're not in the space, it's, it is hard to understand why PBMs exist. 
Like, let's be honest, right? Like, if you don't live it, you're like, I don't understand. They're a middleman. Middleman. Um, I, I do know the value that some PBMs bring. I also know that the way the rebate model is structured also creates perversion in the PBM model. And I think we all have to acknowledge that's a thing, too. So the PBM wasn't a surprise to me that there was some action on states to just have some transparency there um, in terms of the, you know, don't make me pay more for a brand when there's a cheaper generic, um, getting rid of gag clauses. Some of those sort of make sense. By the way, this is all Sarah speaking, not Nicer speaking at this point. Presentation. Um, and transparency, again, kind of is, sure, I should know how much it really costs. How much did you spend on X, Y, and Z? When we have our discussion here, I can share some more about why there's limits to what I think the policy implication can be to transparency. Because again, you get to the point where, okay, well that's how much it costs to develop and that's how much you're charging. How do I know if that's fair? Right? So that's the big open question with the transparency question. And then reimportation to me is fascinating. I get it on the face of it. There's other countries, it's the same exact <laughs> drug. Why can't I just get it for that lower price? But that fails to recognize the negotiating power that that country has, because they're negotiating as an entire country in most cases, and saying, like, this is the price you will give us or you can't sell your drug here. And the other part that I will share, which is sort of fun, is that we get criticized for doing cost-effectiveness. Um, people say it's very controversial and we shouldn't be you know, putting this health maximization threshold out there. Why do you think all of those other countries get a lower price? because they use cost effectiveness and they put a health maximization threshold as the ceiling price. And so I just had to put that one up there for this conversation tonight. So one more slide before conversation, you can click all the way through this. Just, um, just some thoughts and opportunities and challenges here as we think about what are the ways that we can control drug spending or in my uh, you know, vernacular, get better value for the spending we already have. I do believe the grand bargain exists. Um, we did have an example of a company, it was Regeneron, in partnership with Sanofi, who came to us during our review of a new drug for atopic dermatitis, severe eczema, and basically said, we'll give you all the data you want from our clinical trial program, from all of our analyses. You tell us what a fair price is, we're gonna pick that price, and we're gonna go out and say, payers, we did the right thing, make sure patients get access. And that's exactly what happened. I have a few other examples, but I can only count them on one hand so far, and I'm really excited when I can start counting them on two hands, because in my opinion, this is this is the win-win-win. Uh, if I'm the pharmaceutical industry, I don't want federal legislation. I don't want state legislation. I want to demonstrate good faith by using independent analyses as justification for price, putting the right pressure, and pressure is probably not the right word, but, but creating the environment where payers can give access and the patients win. I do think, and we can touch on this in the discussion, the pipeline of gene therapy, cell and gene therapies, um, deserves attention, it deserves pause, it doesn't deserve panic, at least quite yet, in my opinion, but I think there's some really innovative things we can think about in terms of paying for and accessing cell and gene therapies. I also wanted to mention one report we are doing out annually is unsupported price increases. I forgot to mention that as one of the things that states are looking at. Uh, again, I think this is sort of, um, cognitively very attractive, like why do you keep raising your price every year, 10, 15%? And so um, we believe that um, there is the possibility that you could raise your price and it could be justified if you demonstrated better clinical benefit for patients. A lot of the research we do is right at the time of FDA approval, and we have a clinical trial program that might have limitations on what we know about outcomes that matter for patients, longer term outcomes. Imagine you did a trial and you showed better benefit after three years. In ICER's model, that means you can raise your price. You can charge more because you're showing more clinical benefit for patients. Unfortunately, it's more common that the opposite happens. There are no additional data or research produced to show any added clinical benefit. So our report identifies the up to 10 um, highest spending drugs that have gone through price increases um, without any measure of additional benefit for patients. Uh, excuse me for patients. You can see that report every October. I think ensuring a functional um, generic market is just really essential, and I am pretty impressed with the work that's been done on, st on state legislation for that. And then things like Civica RX, a nonprofit generic company being created to try to disrupt the model here. And I think there's some market forces that can work. Um, and public shaming works really well in this one, right? We saw what happened with EpiPen, we saw what happened with Daripen. Um, and then 
aren't we all going to watch really closely to see what happens um, in November? Um, and what will happen as soon as we're not talking about impeachment anymore? Uh, there are several pieces of legislation pending, um, both the Senate and the House side. Um, there are lots of opinions about whether or not it will have a meaningful impact, but continue, the, the fact that this continues to be um, you know, in the 70 to 80 percent range in polling about issues that are keeping consumers up at night means this issue isn't going away. Thank you so much again for having me. I look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I'd now like uh, to ask our panelists to come up and join us, and we'll get uh, right into the Q&A. Um, uh, you know, considering some of the open issues that Sarah had out, I'm going to leave that last slide up to help us as part of the conversation and discussion. Um, but joining us at the, um, well, the day is here, we've got, uh, somebody, as I said earlier, Senator Member Daniel Rosenthal, uh, Helen Shaw, Chuck Bell, I would, and before again, I did just want to acknowledge a few uh, elected officials in their offices who have come, uh, joined us since uh, Assemblywoman uh, Judy uh, Griffin was here. We appreciate her taking the time. Uh, Jacob Sheritz from Assemblywoman Hunter's office is here. Uh, Gideon Lamb from the Assembly Minority's office, and Daniel Pick from Assembly uh, in J uh, Jacobson's office. So we appreciate you taking the time. So with that, uh, I'm going to open it up to the panel. Uh, we'll sort of work, you know, starting with Eileen and, and work our way back. Um, you know, for each of you, uh, in, in, a, in two or three minutes, can you give me a little bit of uh, your reaction to the issues that Sarah outlined and, and where you see that there might be opportunities to address, you know, address some of those challenges? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Sarah. And uh, we are so grateful for ICER and the work of Steve Pearson, uh, the founder and president at CDPHP. We were kind of ICER groupies. So uh, we, we really are engaged in everything that they put out and watching them closely, as we hope uh, the industry will as well. The two things that I would um, like to highlight in the, uh, the model, the pricing model, is first that these drugs are the vehicle of the science to the patient. They are not the entire, they should not be capturing the entire value that the therapy brings to a patient. Because the therapy includes the diagnostics, the physicians, the nurses, the care. So in my opinion, those things should be subtracted from the, the price that is delivered by this model. Because in many cases, there's a lot of cost that goes in to delivering that drug to the patient, to monitoring them, and caring for them. So that whole quality adjusted life year price, no matter which number you pick, needs to include all of those things. So that's the first one. The second point is that I worry that this model is being used by drugs that have been on the market for a long time and feel they're underpriced based on this model when they're already making a, when they launched their price was giving them a nice profit and continues to do so. So I worry that if this is the model we're all gonna land on, what are the prices of even the generics that deliver value? We've seen in the last five years a, a significant increase in the price of generics. And I believe it's in reference to the other high-priced brands that are on the market. So we're worried about it across the board, not just these high-priced um, new innovations. So in general, at uh, Consumer Reports, our business is um, giving recommendations to consumers about comparative value and effectiveness of different products and services. So we're comparative effectiveness friendly. <laughs> Uh, affordability of medications is something that we know really, really matters to patients. And we have evidence that in New York, the, the rising costs of medic medicines are outstripping the ability of people to pay for them. And so, for example, AARP has reported over the five year period between 2012 and 2017, uh, the costs of experimental uh, or prescription drug treatment increased 57%, where all the income. Of, of employees and workers in New York State increased only 11%. Uh, 
And so at the end of the day, I think it's really important to remember who is paying the tab for the whole wholesale acquisition costs or list price of prescription drugs in this country. At the end of the day, it's falling to the consumers, the employers, uh, labor unions, and government agencies like New York State and like Medicare. And uh, for us, it's critical that we not overpay for prescription drugs or other medical uh, treatments because it's outstripping the ability of consumers to afford it. And when we look at just the cost of insurance premiums themselves, for individual plans, consumers pay on average 21% of the cost of their premiums directly. For family plans, 28%. Uh, for many drugs, um, uh, like biologic drugs, consumers may have very steep co-insurance payments. So when the price spikes from 3000 to 5000 for Humira, the consumer's on the hook for that $2,000. And we also have evidence and studies that, uh, or surveys that we've done for consumer reports that people are cutting back on um, other expenses, uh, not paying their credit card bill, or uh, skimping on uh, prices for um, you know, grocery, groceries and clothes and so on. And also when the prices get too high, consumers experience financial toxicity and they put the drug down and they don't even take it. Uh, so for us, this is really critical and we think it's imperative that states begin uh, taking a very aggressive approach to combating prescription drug price spikes and assessing the effectiveness of, of those medications. So, you know, we, as you have mentioned, we, we approach this, uh, I think, in two ways. One, obviously, we represent members. We have a big health fund covering about 100,000 members and their families. It's jointly governed by the union uh, and the employers. It spends uh, about $400 million a year just on prescription drugs. Um, we also have other uh, health funds that we've been able to win for our members. Uh, you know, we have taken it as a principle that at least for, you know, one one drug in every class that the members don't have any co-pays, don't have any cost sharing, and that means the fund really bears the full brunt of that. And you know, when the costs go up, as they've been going up on prescription drugs, you know, five to seven percent a year, uh, that means that it puts a lot of pressure on that fund. The next time we're back at the bargaining table, it's a question about is there less wages that people can get um, in, uh, in terms of increases because because we have to put more money into the fund too to cover those costs. So that's a real concern for us. It's something that the fund grapples with um, every day. And, and really, because it's large, uh, you know, both works through a, a PBM, but you know, does independent uh, uh, negotiations with manufacturers and tries to leverage what the PBM has done to get better prices to make sure we're uh, delivering as much value as we can and the access that, that our members need. So you know, the value of this kind of conversation is very important. Um, and the, the research that ICER brings, I think, plays a big role in that. We're also, uh, you know, obviously looking at the overall Medicaid budget. That's the source of income for a lot of our employers, particularly on the long-term care side, but also on the hospital side. And so when there's pressure there, that means potentially our employers are taking cuts, people are getting laid off, there's a lot of strain in that system, and our members can't deliver the care that they want to deliver uh, to, to people in the state. So we look at it in terms of the pressures on the state budget as well. So this is a very important conversation. We really thank HPA uh, for convening it. Um, I will say I'm maybe a little bit more cynical in the idea that we can get a win-win-win here. I think, uh, you know, you see, you see profit maximization behavior in, uh, you know, in a lot of industries, in this industry in particular, you know, they're going to see what the market will bear and push that um, as hard as possible. And so, you know, I think the point that Eileen raised about not just looking at the clinical effectiveness, which we totally agree is very important and has to be a, a major part of this conversation, but we do need to look at uh, fair price in terms of uh, fair profit, right? Nobody's saying that you can't be a business and have a business, but um, if your entire business is based on price gouging, you know, we think that the payers and particularly the state uh, can step in and say, uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna accept that. And I think uh, you know, uh, we always laugh when we talk about importing drugs from, from Canada. And we can import the policies from Canada, which would be just as effective, right? We don't have to actually import the drugs. They don't have magic, you know, that makes them cheaper there, except for they set the prices, right? So I think we, we uh, you know, we think the state has made some progress in the policies that they've tried to uh, propose in terms of negotiation. So we think we can go further, as other states are trying to do, and there will be some legal challenges there, but from our perspective, you know, fair price is also about, uh, you know, uh, what it costs to produce the thing and, and uh, where, the, where the money is going. Good morning. It's hard to think of an industry 
that has a controlled substance that is so unregulated and has such this lack of transparency. Um, a few months ago, we were dealing with some alcohol, local alcohol store or liquor store that wanted to open up, and we we really dug really deep into the New York State liquor license laws and alcohol laws, and they're so heavily regulated and so transparent, and the hearings are public. But when it comes to pharmaceuticals, when it comes to medication, which is literally life-saving, it seems to be the wild, wild west. And it's unbelievable. We've seen that instance after instance where pharmaceutical companies and medications that have really been around for a long time this drastically uh, increase in price. I'm sure you know the numbers better, but the EpiPen was 460% in seven years, and my numbers are not up. Like, why is that? How is that allowed? And there are things that could be done today to start regulating that. Everything that we do now will be better than what we have today. And with their space, it's time to increase transparency in the transaction part of our civil companies. No one's saying you can't make money. No one's saying you, you know, but there's a, there's a certain accountability that we have to have right now that New York State simply does not have. And we know there's a health care crisis in this country. Health care premiums are, I, I'm probably speaking to the wrong room, but it, it's hard for a lot of people. And it, it might not be your fault. And pharmaceutical companies cannot have really our staple medications having um, their prices be drastically increased. It's time for the state to really act right now. Um, the things that could be done today, we all have legislation that we want to see move forward that will at least have transparency and shed light on that pricing process. If you're the average person walking through, you have no idea what a PBM is. You have, unfortunately, I know all too well now what a PBM is. <laughs> um, never, I think I've been thinking about talking about it at o'clock in the morning, but, um, but it's, time, it's time to add that and to make sure that that is a very important way to try to keep uh, healthcare affordable, to try to add transparency and regulation to how pharmaceuticals are priced in excuse me, to medications. So before we, uh, sorry, I don't want. One quick thing. Yeah, go ahead. Quick, 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 quick. This is super quick because I just wanted. I this point was so important. Uh, we think that our model is appropriate when there's a government granted monopoly on pricing. We do not think the model should apply to generics, right? So generics at that point, uh, you have already gained your share of social surpluses the innovator, and then society is supposed to benefit from that innovation by being able to get it at cost plus. So I, and I just want to make sure I note on that. Thank okay. you. So before we continue, I just want to acknowledge Assemblymember uh, John McDonald and uh, Assemblymember Kevin Byrne from, uh, for joining us today. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're all very busy today, uh, especially with the budget yesterday. Uh, to, uh, excuse me, to Otto Wilson from Assemblyman uh, Mark Tillow's office, thank you for coming. So so following up, let's sort of take you know, some of the specifics from Sarah's presentation and, and let's sort of start with that low-hanging fruit and then sort of build from there. So. One of the things, or a couple of the things that Sarah had mentioned was around state transparency of prescription drugs. We've seen other states like Vermont uh, has you know, for a number of years required transpar you know, transparency for a select number of uh, products. Uh, California, for example, has you know, taken that and come one step further with, with early warning. Um, can folks, on, you know, I'll, I'll start with, you know, that come back down this way. You, know, you start with Sarah and working for it. What's transparency look like to you and the constituents that, that you represent? Um, and then how do we take, you know, take those steps around transparency, maybe build from that as to the things that would get at the, the underlying uh, price, price increases? Um, you know, from where we sit, the transparency, it, the most frustrating part of transparency when we try to do an analysis is understanding the true net price. Um, so for a lot of the drugs that we look at, um, we can get wholesaler acquisition costs, that's public. Um, and we use um, a firm that does some analysis based on publicly available information to approximate net price. Um, but it will tell you one of the most entertaining comments we got when we first launched our value assessment program on new drugs. We were using WAC because that was all we could find publicly. And the manufacturers were like, your, your entire analysis is flawed because nobody pays WAC. Let's be clear, people who are uninsured pay WAC. So let's put that aside. So it's not entirely true. But I was like, okay, then great. Tell us what your net price is. Crickets. Yes. And so, um, so the transparency piece there for us is that like no one truly knows the net price because the negotiated uh, rebate agreements with the PBMs are all secret. Uh, you know, people have argued to me why that's really important and why we need that and that it drives lower prices. It's, it's, it's a piece of information that I think would help us understand what the true value is. Um, because right now we can just come up with, we think it's, not we think, this is the price that aligns with clinical benefit. We don't actually know if anyone's getting that. And that's a really tough part for us when we're trying to measure our impact because 
we say, okay, we think the fair price is 50, and this external group says, well, we think net price is like 75, and then we get whispers from people that are like, yeah, we're getting 50. I was like, you should, you should please say that publicly. Like, so transparency for us on what the true net cost is, I think is really important to have a grown-up conversation here. When you go into a store, you know how much something costs. You can go online, you can see how much something costs. But when you come to medications, you have no idea how much something costs or how much it will cost the next day. There are very simple things that we should do, including increasing reporting um, for pharmaceutical companies. Um, why should a pharmaceutical company should, have, should explain why they're raising their prices? Did their ingredients go up? Did their wholesale costs go up? Why are they raising their prices? And also, let's have some more stability. Require them to notify us when they are going to raise their prices. You shouldn't all of a sudden find out one day that, oh, that medication shot up. Your plan is to find something else. When they are going to increase their prices a significant amount, which is going to affect the consumer, have, require them to do that. You can't go into a store and one day something shoots up 100% or 200%. You wouldn't buy the product. We are forced to buy these products. We need these products to live sometimes. So have them give everyone a warning. No other free market, consumer, capitalist thing can just all of a sudden shoot prices up and you're stuck with that. So if, you, if there is a real reason for that, fine. Explain it to us. Let us know why you're doing that. You can't just shoot up life crucial medications 200% and not have to explain it. We want these companies to have to explain the rationale. We're not saying don't do it, but if you really need to do it, let the consumer know why. Let the insurance plans know why. And right now, there's none of that. And it's really, it's, it's still fascinating when you look at these things. And there's no other industry with such a lack of competition, of public competition, or public accountability. So let's create that public accountability now. <clears throat> Certainly, I agree. You know, in terms of the impact on the consumer, uh, you know, I think the other thing that's true in healthcare, though, is that it's quite complicated in who the consumer is, who the payer is, and the shares of those two things. And I think uh, I think transparency can get oversold, not just on drugs, but on other uh, types of things that we pay for in healthcare, in, in how it actually drives consumer behavior and changes markets. Because uh, you have to, both you have to know the price, which you know and I agree is a valuable thing, but you then have to be able to act on that price um, to change your behavior, to change the price that you pay to move the whole market. And I'm not sure that that is a straight align uh, in healthcare in particular because the role of insurers and consumers and the way that those two things interact uh, that it is in, in other kinds of markets. So, you know, yeah, I think transparency is a good thing. I'm not sure we should oversell it as the thing that's going to fix the pricing. So I've been working on healthcare issues on, from a consumer perspective for over 30 years. So before the impeachment, we had the Clinton <laughs> I guess I feel like if you had told me 30 years ago we'd still be on the pay for service system in 2020, I would have said maybe marijuana is already legal. Like I don't, I can't believe that this is where we are. But I do think um, I agree with what's been said. I think sometimes transparency is oversold. But coming from the lens of the healthcare advocacy community here in New York State, um, representing groups like Healthcare for All New York and AARP, we are very pro transparency because we feel like it's a really important foot in the door to get the basic information about how the pharmaceutical supply chain is working and to begin to have a cop on the beats and a public conversation about what we're gonna do about it. It sends an important signal to pharma that change is coming. And um, if we look at the rates of return for the top Fortune 500 companies, they tend to be between six and 9%. For the top uh, 25 drug companies, they're between 15 and 20%. So there is a level of profit, uh, profit making in this industry that's been remarkably durable. And when there is more attention and more scrutiny, like for example, Kaiser Family uh, Foundation has found that 80% of voters right now think drug prices are unreasonable. So we get slightly more moderate increases for a while until the issue recedes from public view. So the price increase system has been remarkably resilient and durable um, over the last uh, 30 years. And we as advocates and citizens are in the position where we can finally begin to change that. And then looking at it also from a consumer lens, um, there are real questions when consumers go to visit prescribers and, and medical providers, will I be able to fill that prescription? 
to, you know, do I have the economic resources to handle the co-insurance and the co-payments are going to be due for that? We have within the electronic health record systems now some better transparency tools at the individual level that allow providers to know much more specifically how much a drug is going to cost and whether the patient's going to be able to fill that prescription. And so from that perspective, it is also very important uh, for patients. And we did a survey of, of, of physicians where we found that eight out of 10 uh, doctors know that um, affordability is a key issue for the patients they serve, but the issue of price only came in up about 2.6 uh, uh, out of 10 encounters. So um, affordability is important, a uh, whole health system has to deal with it, and we want better information to the patients. Uh, and I think having the prescribers knowing how much the drug costs uh, really does help uh, move the dial. So we want what Maryland has and other states that are doing transparency laws. Great. I want to pick up on that last point about the prescriber. So we believe that transparency uh, on price needs to reach the point of care. It needs to be transparent to those who are paying for it and to those who are impacting the system by ordering those, those drugs. So there's a lot of pieces that are not available to the patient and their prescribing practitioner at that point of care. And so the right decision could be made for the patient on having a coupon, on doing something, but the healthcare system is paying a huge unaffordable slice of that because the prescriber does not know, does not have the true net cost. So I want to go back to uh, what Sarah said. It really is about true net cost. We need to make that transparent to all, everyone who touches that patient order prescription therapy, including pharmacies. So how do we guide our patients and navigate if we're not giving our providers the true net cost information? Can I just say one? Yeah. Uh, just to say, you know, it, this is where our very complex healthcare system does not serve people well, right? When, you know, if you think about it, how does it, you know, the, the, the having information in the electronic health record, not just you know, what plan, but specifically what product, exactly what that covers, what the, you know, all, how complicated all of that is. I mean, people barely know that their provider is a network, right? Um, as we know. Um, so, uh, you know, that's where the complexity of our system really works against, uh, you know, solving these problems. And there are, there are simpler systems out there, which I know is not the subject of this conversation, but, um, but it's where make, solving these problems becomes very difficult. So, <clears throat> Picking up on, so we started with transparency. Chuck, you, you know, one of the points you made was transparency is a good foot in the door. Um, but from a consumer standpoint, what's what's the next step around that? I mean, knowing what the price is, and you can you maybe go online and identify what you might pay, either through your health plan or through some other online resources. But when you talk to the consumers that you represent, I mean, what would be the next thing that would you know, get us past, you know, to, to be meaningful from the consumer standpoint? Well, I think it's really a larger set of stakeholders that have to take action. And we, we give all types of recommendations on how people can save money in the healthcare system we have. But I think as the point has been made, if, if I'm getting a coupon for something, what the, the higher costs of that drug are being passed along to me, my health insurance premium, and my employer or union is taking the hits, it's really not financially sustainable. So I think we need policy interventions. And so, for example, in the state of the state, um, the governor has proposed giving the Department of Financial Services uh, the authority to go after price spikes. Uh, so when there are egregious price spikes, if they're reported and we see that they're happening, uh, that will give um, New York State more, um, uh, more capacity to address those issues for consumers. And I think also by making the, um, the, the prices more visible and more focus of, of conversation and having state capacity to intervene, that's what's going to be important because we sit back a lot for uh, much of the year thinking that Congress is going to take action on this question, and it's very slow. You know, the states are the laboratories of reform. They pioneer the models that then go to the federal level, in my opinion. So I think giving more, um, we would also support having a, a commercial drug uh, utilization review board uh, for, for patients who are in the commercial market. Uh, we think it's a good principle. We shouldn't be overpaying for um, for drugs in that sector either. So, so, th so those are two things. But I think it's, it's it's getting a cop on the beat. It's not just watching the prices go up. It's developing the state capacity to go after those price spikes. And stuff. 
I, I later, early on, you, you mentioned that um, the ICE, you know, the ICER model is, is important, but there are additional items to that. Can you, can, can you mind expanding on that a little bit as far as what would be you know, helpful areas where if there are concerns that um, you know, products that have been in the market or, or drugs that have been in the market now become becoming subject to that? I mean, you're starting at sort of one baseline, and if you use them, the model potentially goes up. Can you talk a little bit about so where that, what the concern might be and potential tweaks? Yeah, so I, I just want to go back to the generic market because if you look at 85% to 90% of all prescriptions filled are in the generic space. Only 15% are brand, but when you look at today, and it's higher than it used to be, today about 20% of the spend is in the 85% of those prescriptions. So when you look at $100 million worth of spend, you've got 90% of prescriptions being <laughs> filled for 20 million of those dollars. So the other 80 million is in this small 15, 10 to 15%. And when you further take that brand uh, sector and put it into these rare and ultra rare orf orphan diseases that we often call specialty drugs, we're talking about 1% of those prescriptions are in that sector, and they are claiming $40 million. So that you, when you start to look at covering lives, you can see that the premiums are going way up to cover these innovative therapies. So there's, there's really two ends to the, the concern and to the opportunity that we have. And one thing is we know that every person, every business model that touches the drug, that it passes through their hands, makes a percentage, does not really have the right business incentive to, follow, to solve this problem. Everyone that touches the drug, every time these prices go up, you know, they're in a good place. So we need to look at what is the business model for delivering these drugs and should it be a percentage? Should it be a flat fee? And there's a lot of work that CMS has done to look at this. You know, they're publishing. We need to figure out what is a fair price for the work being done at the manufacturer, but then also from the manufacturer and every person that touches it. So there's opportunity there. And one, the one piece that is missing now because of this perverse model is the participation of pharmacists because they're they're working in this space that's grinding these things out and do not have the time to put their education on helping patients manage these prescriptions, th these therapies, and get better. So the model from manufacturer to patient is not aligned with good care or affordable care. So, uh, Assemblyman, Chuck had mentioned the, uh, the governor's proposal, and, and folks may have not had a chance to really dig into it over the over the last you know, 12 hours or so. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to ask you about specifics, but you know, the, the proposal does talk about, as Chuck pointed out, uh, DFS having additional authority. Uh, as we've looked at it, it would, it would set that threshold at price increases that that go up by 100 percent in a 12-month period. Now, talking to some folks before the session started, particularly some of the planned pharmacy uh, uh, staff. You know, there are instances where you may see certain drugs uh, you know, go up 100%, so it may happen more likely and more frequently than we expect, but then you know, there are certainly on a monthly basis drugs that they see going up 50%. What would you, you know, without having the benefit of really digging into it, I mean, does a 100% does increase really start the threshold, or do you think that there might need to be you know, some additional tweaking of, of, of this language to think about what the right number could be. Well, if someone from the governor's office is here, it's great. If they're not here, it's ridiculous. You can drive a truck through it. Um, <laughs> um, um, we actually, so I have a bill that would require them to report at 10%. 100% is insane. When, imagine going to the grocery store, again, let's use that example. Imagine going to the grocery store, buying a box of crackers for $2, coming back a week later, and it's all of a sudden $4 things of that sort, it just doesn't make sense. It's very easy to get around a 100% cap, and I highly doubt that a company really needs to raise something 100% unless they can show that their costs all of a sudden overnight went up 100%, which is really never happens. When, when, when does someone's cost go up 100% overnight like that? 
So I don't think that 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 proposal is um, they're gonna have the governor. You have to give the governor credit. Uh, back in December, he said he was going to do things. He's going to add transparency to this, and he is doing that. We'll see what the final negotiated language is. Um, to see how big that ten percent was. What I what, was what my bill calls for. He's calling for hundred percent. Um, hopefully, we get closer to ten percent. Um, uh, closer to the ten percent side of that. Um, and then someone before said that transparency isn't, isn't fully the answer, and it's not fully the answer, but I think it's something that we can do immediately. And also was mentioned also previously in the panel that once public perception or the public attention goes down, the pharmaceutical companies then raise their price. And that's why we're calling for transparency, so it's easier to have that information. It's easier to keep that public attention on it. Make it easier reportable. Well, that way, that public attention doesn't die down and they can't jack up the prices like what we've seen. Just, yeah, okay. just to be done, I was not arguing against yeah. transparency, we are just pointing out, I think sometimes people think it's more of a metrical than an actual. It's, a, it's an, obviously it's an important tool because if you don't know what it is, you know, it's really hard to come up with policy solutions, uh, but it's certainly a starting point that other states have taken. You know, Helen, you brought up um, the big elephant in the room, the, you know, the Medicaid shortfall mm -hmm. and the challenge there. I think you guys have you know, as you pointed out, a unique perspective as both the purchaser, but also you know, as a you know, as representing folks who you know, really are on the front lines of delivering services for uh, this population. So, with the state facing a four billion or so spending gap in Medicaid, depending upon you know, what you know, early went down. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> depending on what the number is at this point in time, but I'm, you know. And obviously, there'll be conversations about your provider rates and health plans and things like that. But you know, prescription drugs is a big piece of that. Um, you know, there's been conversations about ways to maybe go at that. How would you see, or what steps do you think the state needs to be taking um, to you know, to you know, better contain the prescription drug prices? And Sarah outlined what the DERP has done, um, but that's again limited to, to certain instances where the state can't get. Uh, an additional supplemental rebate, but uh, you know, again, it doesn't really deal with, with the price piece. It doesn't deal with what the cost, what the cost is, and what the state ends up having to spend. Right. I mean, you know, as I, we certainly support very aggressive moves in this regard in terms of you know following uh, following other countries and actually you know having a public process to set prices. Um, you know, I don't think that's particularly on the horizon uh, here. You know, and and uh, no state has quite gotten that far. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I know that there's a conversation about uh, carving the benefit out of the share, and I, you know, we frankly are still trying to understand whether, uh, you know, you could repeat what it seems like West Virginia did in terms of, you know, getting a lower spend even with the dispensing fee. You know, I, I think there's the jury still out on whether that um, would be an effective way to save money in the Medicaid program, but I certainly know people are uh, advocating that. I think. Um, you know, I, I agree that uh, that looking at price spikes, which is obviously just a you know, it's more in the commercial side, um, it's a good thing, but we should be more aggressive on that side too. Um, you know, we're for every tool that could be put on the table to deal with the drivers of cost, um, including prescription. So, Sarah, you had mentioned earlier about the, the work you guys, uh, the reports that you guys have put out in October, looking at. <laughs> Price increases for drugs that have been on the market, whether the you know, clinical uh, benefits have changed. Can you, you know, provide a little more perspective on that and you know, why that's so important? I think, mean, given some of the comments, particularly what Eileen had said earlier about you know, drugs that have been on the market for, for a number of years and how the clinical assessment process would work, I think it's, it's helpful to you know, provide that kind of context for folks who aren't aware of that. Sure. It's, okay. it's actually, I think, a really important. I don't want to call it a philosophical difference, but there, there's different ways that people talk about deciding what a fair price is. Right? So assembly members talked a couple of times about well, how much does it cost to make? Did your, the cost of your ingredients go up? Did the cost of your labor go up? Um, that's A lot of people consider that a way to determine fairness. How much does it cost you to develop it and manufacture it and, and sell it? Um, there are people who are um, uh, more in line with what we do at SR, which is it should be about the point of benefit. And one of the reasons we have chosen this as a path is because you could have a situation where somebody's incentivized to spend more to develop a drug, pay their staff more, 
buy the most expensive ingredient because then you can justify a higher price. And so when countries have tried to do this, the, the, the best example is Japan tried to use this as the metric for what a fair price was. They really did look at R&D costs and the cost, and they, and they ended up not being able to decide what was fair. And it was very difficult because they had to rely on the companies to tell them all those costs. They didn't have a way to judge the fairness of all of those costs. I don't think there's a problem with getting that information, but as to judgment for what's fair, I see some, some challenges. So when you take the approach we do, which is say, what's the added benefit for our patients? That's what we want to pay for. That's the incentive we want to give manufacturers. I don't care if it takes you three years or 30 years to develop the drug. If it's a huge magnitude of benefit for patients, I want to reward that type of innovation. Because maybe it does take 30 years to develop the amazing gene therapy, and, and I want you to be rewarded for that. But if it took you three years and it's a marginal benefit for patients, why on earth would you think that society should pay $500,000 for that, right? So that's a little more where we are. So back to the unsupported price increase. This was also, um, we got a lot of pushback on this from some experts. I remember being on a phone call with one who was like, the costs are already sunk once they've launched the product and it's out there. Help me understand how they should ever raise the price anything more than inflation, because that's just the cost of goods sold at that point. And again, that's just a philosophical difference about how we determine what's fair. So for us, we didn't go to look to see if there were the evidence justified the price. We just looked to see if there was any evidence, right? Because our process is eight months long. So if we found a drug that went up by 10% and there was new evidence that it had a better benefit for that indication, we just took it off the list. Because for us to know whether or not the increase in the price matched the clinical benefit for patients would take the whole eight month process. But what I think the policy implication here is the number of drugs for whom there, for which there were no additional data on benefit for patients. So clearly, they increased the price because they could. And that is the policy message that we're trying to send, is you can have a way to sort of cut that pie and then leave the ones where there was some evidence of additional clinical benefit aside because there's a ton of cost savings to have if you can take a look at the ones where they raised the price and didn't actually tell you if there was any added benefit. So that's just sort of the flip So uh, before we keep going, I just want to acknowledge Assemblyman uh, Meg Delo for, for coming. Thank you for coming today. Um, we've got about you know, 10, 15 more minutes left. I know it's a session day. I want to get people out of here early. Um, let me just see if there are any questions from folks in the audience. I've got more questions, but if there are, I, I, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that folks have an opportunity to ask any questions. Yes, sir. Um, Sarah, uh, we had about 11 bills introduced in Maine this year that affected prescription drugs in one form or another, including being a wholesaler, uh, which I'm not sure it's going to go anywhere. But one of them was uh, to, to prohibit prescription drug advertising because they felt there was a, uh, an adverse impact on, on utilization. Does that really happen? When people see it on TV, do they really go to their doctors? I mean, is there empirical evidence to show us really happen? Yeah, it's, it's a great question to repeat. I don't know for the, it's, it's what impact do we know um, direct-to-consumer advertising has? There's been a lot of academic research on this, on um, the uh, increase in prescribing for particular conditions based on advertising. Um, they've also been able to show, there might be people here who are going to correct me, you guys keep me honest here. They've been able to show that it also increases brand prescribing when a generic is available because people are like, I feel more comfortable to brand because I've seen it on TV, so I want that one. So that can create a problem in the provider-patient relationship where the provider is going to be like, seriously, this, this generic is just as good. Um, what I find really interesting about the argument about it is um, I've gotten to know the pharmaceutical industry quite well through my job, both having worked in the industry for 10 years and now 10 years at ICER. They wouldn't do it if it didn't work. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they just wouldn't. So they do cost effectiveness research. Uh -huh. On direct to consumer advertising. Here's an ROI. I have a question. Go Sorry. Also a big fan of ICER. Um, really love the approach. But one of the things I, that I thought was mentioned earlier on that you might be discussing certain payment models for gene and cell therapies. Right? Great question. So um, one of the concerns we know, for example, so Jensma, the gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy, Adexis had come out and said we would love to put together a payment model where at, at certain increments, yearly increments, if the child does not survive, we rebate back money standing in the way is a Medicaid best price rule. Yeah. So where are we with the ability for CMMI to model pilots or 
get the politicians to consider alteration for, to plan for the I, future. Great question. I, I'm actually, and this is, again, just to repeat for if you didn't hear it, what, what can we do with some of the regulatory barriers to pay over time for cell and gene therapies, which is one way we can approach making them more affordable. I will also put out, I do not think that's the panacea to how we're going to afford them. Um, we have a new um, adaptation to our framework that talks about these single and short-term therapies because of Again, grown up conversations we have to have about who gets all of the social surplus when you cure a disease. Does it all accrue to the manufacturer or does society benefit from that? So that might help moderate some of the prices. Back to your question, I actually think there is some opportunity for CMS to carve out some ways for best price not to be impacted. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, just to, to be specific, I wasn't talking about the payment over time. I was talking about the, the rebate. rebate because tied to yes, right, yes. yes. Well, if the, the pay over time also zero. impacts it too, but yes. And, and what, but what I'm really interested in is. I don't think, the, the reason that Medicaid best price exists is because we sort of have a social contract that there are <coughs> most vulnerable citizens and we're not supposed to price gouge them. And so I'm a little bit worried about making a lot of exceptions to best price that end up so that Medicaid doesn't benefit from all the innovation that we have with payment models and all of these other things. So I do think there's an appetite at CMS to carve out for some pilots to see how it works. I think we all owe it to our compadres in Medicaid to make sure that this doesn't end up negatively impacting them where they end up paying a much higher cost than some of the commercial payers because that's the exact opposite goal of this person. Other questions? All right, well, in the interest of time, I'm going to, so we're going to take one more question. I've just made each of you a healthcare czar. Um, so you're in charge of all of healthcare. <laughs> it can be New York, it can be nationally, your choice. Um, but. Tell me the one thing that if you were in charge of running the healthcare system, what you would want to see done around prescription drug costs. Um, and it can be anything that we've already talked about or it can be something that we, uh, that we haven't brought up. Sarah, I'll start with you. So everyone's going to guess mine, right? So price in line with the clinical benefit for patients. The quick example here is that a $2.1 million for curing um, spinal muscular atrophy would cost $750 million at the current price. If we brought the price of the first three cystic fibrosis drugs down to a fair price range based on ISO's analysis, we would save $1.5 billion each year. That would cure every child with SMA, and we'd have $750 million for other priorities in healthcare. This is not a zero sum game. There is plenty of money to make sure that every patient get ac gets access in a way they can afford for their families, themselves, and the health system. I'm not gonna be able to save you a billion dollars in one line like that. <laughs> also, I can test I've never bought a medication based on a commercial I saw. Um, I think we need to treat pharmaceutical companies like we treat every other controlled substance in the state. Heavy regulated and make it transparent in the process. You can, you can go online and watch a, and watch a hearing on to, uh, the state liquor authority, um, to medical marijuana. Let's regulate pharmaceuticals, like pharmaceutical, like, like regulate every other controlled substance. So, you know, building on Sarah, I totally agree. We should, um, you know, prices should be aligned with the clinical effectiveness. And, you know, frankly, um, we'll add from my perspective as a kind of a reasonable price, you know, in terms of the gouging issue. But you have to have the mechanism to do that, which is a government, uh, you know, a government board that sets prices. That's, that's, that, that's the only way that you do that across the board. Well, if I, been, if I was in charge of everything, um, I just said healthcare check. <laughs> yeah, I only have so much power. I guess I have three areas that I think are really critical. Uh, one would be to get real about competition policy because we have been having some really gargantuan health uh, healthcare mergers. Uh, we now have three PBMs that you know cover 150 million lives. Uh, we have uh, lots of mergers taking place in, among generic and brand manufacturers. Uh, we're not. We're waving through those mergers without imposing the appropriate conditions, or perhaps like not denied enough mergers. So that, that's one thing. The second thing would be to experiment with the models we use for research and developments uh, to uh, create models that are more aligned with the patient interest. And so, um, Civic RX was uh, mentioned earlier about a group of hospitals getting together to manufacture generic medicines. Uh, the state of California is also talking about creating a generic company. 
Uh, I think we need to be looking at things like that because the structures we have, we're having what, shortages and price spikes with generics that are not working out for people. And then the third thing is the um, biologic drugs. We're not going to be able to use the same generic model that we have probably. And that's going to be an enormous hit to Medicaid and to consumers. And I think we need to get out in front of that issue and figure out what to do about it. So three things. One is obviously, you know, that price for value but also transparency. And the point I make here is that those consumers and employers who pay for the commercial plans also pay for Medicaid. So that, you know, the same price for everyone is, is what I would be uh, advocating for. And then the business models downstream from the manufacturer that free and pay the professionals, the physicians, the nurses, the pharmacists to manage the patient and not be getting a percentage of the drug. So alignment on these price increases, that it's about outcome and it's about care. Well, thank you, and to Chuck's point, um, in a couple of weeks on the consolidation uh, issue, we will be having a forum looking at provider consolidation and ways to address that, including some of the things that Chuck, you had just mentioned. So. Um, you're already ahead of the game with your, your role as healthcare czar. So uh, with that, thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel. This has been a great conversation.